So, you know, one of the big concerns is like when you watch movies growing up like Terminator, right? <laughs> you know, things like um, you would want, the, I would not want to be in a position to where now I have lost control. I know that we are smarter than, than technology itself. We're the ones building it, but how far can it go? That's what I want to know. <laughs> and so I'm interested in learning more about AI because uh, I want to see where the, the last job that a human is going to have is going to be. And is that the kind of job you're going to spread? <laughs> I mean, I'm going to try, yeah. There is this sense that there's an inevitability around technological change. And even in the last couple of years, we felt a bit of a backlash. In fact, some people are calling it a tech-lash. That all these technologies that we've so willingly and almost uncritically adopted are now, we're all saying, well, wait a minute. And yet, at the same time, we're about to have the next wave of that as we see artificial intelligence, the Internet of Things, all these new technologies are going to not just invade our screens anymore that we carry with us all the time, but every inch of our lives. So when we had you register, we asked you to come up with one word that you thought of when, when you thought about AI. And so you can see here, you can see words like robots, scary, potential, ethics, and obviously the most popular one is future. What you're going to hear today is that AI is actually not in the future. AI is here right now. The bar is, let me write some software that could do just as good as you so that someone looking at it could not tell the difference. And the benefit to that was, oh my goodness, I don't have to do that anymore, <laughs> right? If, if a machine could do it, I can now focus on other things. How far along are we? I mean, is this, are, we, are we in the late innings of this game, or is this really still the beginning of AI? Oh, that's a good question. So we really are still in the beginning of AI. However, we are way further along in democratizing that content as ever before. Um, so there, these are all of the pre-built models that exist today. These are things you can do with a web service any web developer has access to. Everything from speech to text analytics to uh, video indexing. One of the biggest one is content moderation. So why AI now? Um, AI is such a big part of the conversation right now because um, it's definitely gone from theory, but now we're in the era of implementation. That means it's going to work its way into our everyday lives, but more importantly, you are going to make choices about how to implement it, when to implement it, and why to do so. So what about AI for everyday problems? One of the things that we kind of encounter quite a bit is trying to find parking. Um, it can be a really, really irritating thing to find parking, but what if I can use AI to help me find parking, even let me know via text that a parking space is available? Well, that exists. You said technology will not take away jobs. How does technology, if it's perfected in the self-driving cars and trucks, not take away jobs? I think, I think it evolves those jobs, right? It's one of the biggest users of actually AR and VR because there's a shortage of being able to train people quickly enough. Um, so when you look at things like transportation or transportation professionals, I ask myself, why do many folks actually want to even drive Uber? Is it because they want to be a driver? It is that source of income. So uh, what AI may reduce the number of Uber drivers or drivers in general, but it also then improves the ability for you to learn new skill sets, to do the jobs you really truly want to do. Um, and, it, and it's not just in isolation. It actually positively impacts many other areas there as well. What was interesting to learn was how available these applications are to everybody. That a lot of it is open source and that they use a lot of these tools publicly so people can experiment with them and iterate on ideas that these big companies have and, and make them their own and, and become more familiar with the actual technology as it becomes more integrated into our everyday lives. There really is no neutral way to build a technology. Every technology from the simplest to the most complicated is a set of value choices. You know, the narrative is our brick and mortar systems are biased and broken, and they often are. Uh, but what follows from that in terms of the narrative is, well, tech is gonna come in and fix those biases because tech is supposed to be neutral and unbiased. Unfortunately, uh, that's not necessarily proving to be the case, and I'll take you some, through some examples of, of, of why that is, but uh, unfortunately, if we don't put the value structure in place before implementing the technology, it turns out that often the historic biases in the system 
uh, either go through the data and, and cause the tool to amplify the biases, make them worse, uh, or even a, even a perfect system uh, uh, is targeted to certain communities and has a disproportionate impact. So two NBA players, the, uh, the algorithm rated one of these men to be 57% happy and 0.1% angry, and the other one 39% happy and 27% angry. Guess which was which? I think you know, right? Um, so my leave with you all is lead with the values, not with the tech, right? I think with any technology comes some inherent fear, but the sort of sentient AI robots are coming to steal our jobs is, is, is largely inflated. The real thing we need to be conscious of is making sure that we don't pass human bias onto the AI tools that we use. They did mention that regulation comes 10, 15 years behind the, you know, our technological improvements. And um, I really think that that process should be sped up a bit. It's just that there are no new laws that are being put into place. It's always, they're trying to find w where it fits in with current laws. People have a lot of trust in data and a lot of trust in machines as this all-powerful thing. Um, and if we just put that blind trust in there without understanding how they're built um, and the institutionalized systems that guide the people who are building them, then we have the potential to build something that's more harmful than good. So we had, obviously, Shankar talking about vulnerable communities and maybe law to a certain degree, but we want to get at the issue of values as well. Do we have to be a healthy human entity to be able to apply these technologies? One way that you can make these kinds of decisions more confidently is always go back to the principles. So uh, most large tech companies at least have pretty fleshed out ethical principles around how they'll use AI and machine learning in their products. How do we build experiences if we're not the ones building the products? And I think this is really relevant for the audience today. Um, I'm not writing the code, um, and you might not write the code, but what you can do is tell the story. You can articulate the vision, the user experience that you want to see in the world. In short, we need you. Diversity is essential, not just around gender and color, but also diversity of thought, because the way engineers might approach a problem is probably different by, um, from the way we would approach a problem. And you can't just have a room of engineers making all these decisions. You need to be part of that conversation. Leadership is not only for people who have technically a leader question title. In their name, right? So how do you work with your team? What kind, you can have that conversation with your teams to be like, okay, well, what is important to us? What are the ways that we want to engage with each other, right? And I want to be very clear, and I appreciate your question, that prioritizing organizational culture and values and behaviors at any kind of a level at an organization is not only unicorns and daisies, and most of the times it's not, right? This is why it's so tricky. <laughs> It takes a storyteller to understand your industry and then know, you know how the AI is going to make an impact on that and, and find the people who are um, you know, more, you know, the, the intelligent people who are enabled to, to make more progress and innovate better. You're the one who's got to speak to the technologists to make sense of what they're doing, right? How hard of a conversation is that? Um, so they, they can be difficult, but it's mostly because they talk in a different language from me. I'm looking for the creative and the story and the, the color and the details that I can build out. Who can I talk to? Who can I interview? And they're like, I, I, I want to talk to you how we built this, and let me show you like the pages and pages of tests and results. And, and I'm like, I, I don't know what that means, and acronyms. This is, actually gets to my vision for what I think we as communication leaders want to be. We're not just the people who externally communicate the values and products of a company, but should be the ones who act as agents of transition, uh, translation and transformation, can sort of have the big picture of what's going on with the, the organization and can catalyze that kind of change that makes things better. And that's what I hope people open up to the communicators as we think about that interface between technology and user. It's an important role to communicate the potential pitfalls or risks of using this technology. You know, if we have an understanding of it, even if it's on a somewhat superficial level, but we you know, know how it's being used and know the potential impacts, I think we have um, almost like gatekeepers in some sense. We all in the end are going to end up having to make decisions 
but where we stand on how AI should be used and how it should join up with other technologies so that we can have uh, the future we'd actually like to give our kids as opposed to some of, those, some of the fears we have about the future. So from what you've seen so far in your reporting and even what you've yeah. been hearing here, how equipped are we to make those decisions as a society? I think we're close, actually. I think we're closer than we think because we know we should trust our instincts. I think that that, that part's happened. The problem is that we all have fragments of agency. If we could figure out what to do with our small chunk of agency. Really understanding that we can shape this rather than it shaping us is a huge first step. And I think that, you know, at, I work at Microsoft and we give a lot of love to the idea that uh, uh, the way to predict the future is to build it, is to create it. But, you know, if you really take that challenge further, it's that we will all build the future that every day we're told is coming. And I think calm lead is to find out that human-centered future that we actually want to live in and persuade that and communicate that so that we all go to work and the engineers go to work every day and build it.